Uh, hello and welcome to the Mutual Fund Show. I'm Nita Chan. Over the next uh, 20 odd minutes, we'll talk about uh, two or three key aspects which might be top of the mind for investors as we start a new financial year. Of course, as we will probably do now with every single show that we do, we are going to be trying and talking about one, uh, one little educative piece uh, on every show. Um, just to make people understand the different facets that are involved with mutual fund investing. So for, for example, on this show, we're going to be talking about the importance of a mutual fund fact sheet. A lot of you or all of you invest, get fact sheets. They probably get deleted from your email account the moment you get it. But maybe there is some importance to that, which might help you in making better decisions. So we'll talk about that as well. Uh, to talk about that on the show, two gentlemen need no introduction now. They've been on the show enough. Uh, joining us for the second time is Santosh Joseph, of course. Founder and managing partner of Germinet, and uh, joining us for a num for the for the umpteenth time is Ashish Somaya, CEO of White Oak Capital. Ashish, the one complaint that we probably have is that ever since you've shifted, uh, you don't join us as often. So we hope to correct that over the course of FY23. <laughs> It'd be my pleasure. It'd be my pleasure. <laughs> okay, so le let's 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 get started talking about uh, the first piece, and I think we've done two shows on it, but. It probably comes on topic every single time and more so this week because it's the RBI policy meet as well. And that is what should an investor who's wanting to invest in the debt side or fixed income funds uh, do currently? Should he opt for uh, a particular variety of funds? Should he opt for some safety even within the debt fund simply because the road to what the Reserve Bank of India will do over the course of the year is not quite clear? Ashish, if we can start off the conversation with you. Yeah, I think, you know, see, one thing is, uh, one thing seems to be clear, whether one looks at US and, you know, the rate tightening and, you know, one, whether one looks at the external scenario or uh, one looks at, you know, higher and higher input prices, metal prices, commodity prices, food prices, uh, domestic inflation, or even one looks at what RBI has been saying about, uh, you know, our own economic trajectory. I think from all perspectives, uh, you know, it's a matter of time, but it does appear that when there is an economic recovery uh, domestically, uh, because of geopolitics, when you know commodity and oil prices are going up, uh, because you know we are dependent on the Western world and there are some linkages because we are increasingly in a global economy. So from every direction, uh, there is a feeling that you know interest rates are set to uh, go up. In any case. Uh, what we witnessed in the last couple of years was unusual circumstances where there was very, very high liquidity, very low uh, interest rates. So I think interest rates are set to rise. Now, you know, when does it happen? At what pace it happens? I think that's probably impossible to uh, forecast. So keeping in mind all of these circumstances, I think uh, for any investor who's looking to deploy uh, money in debt, uh, there is good news and there is bad news. Uh, the good news is that over the next year or two, when you keep deploying, you're incrementally likely to get better and better yields compared to what you have got uh, in the past. But at the same time, uh, you know, if you deploy anything today uh, and, you know, if the interest rates start rising, so if you're in, you know, long, long term bonds or anything which has the interest rate risk, then you might see some kind of turbulence, some downside uh, on your investment. So I think the best thing to do would be probably in my understanding uh, is that right now, uh, be at the shorter end, meaning park money in uh, funds which have six month, 12 month uh, kind of uh, duration. Uh, don't invest in bonds with, you know, 10, 20, 30 year kind of uh, maturities. So if you're talking, since we're talking mutual funds, uh, in terms of mutual funds, the category is either ultra short term or short term or low duration uh, kind of uh, funds is what it appears that one should do. And maybe a year or two later, uh, when interest rates have seen a sufficient uh, rise, you know, and when economic conditions are slightly different on the inflation front, uh, then maybe you might want to change uh, the strategy. But for now, it seems to be that, you know, you should be in low duration funds or short term kind of funds. Okay. Santosh, how are you uh, approaching this? What is it that you're telling your clients? And by the way, your answer could be different from what Ashish is recommending, of course. Yeah, so but I think Ashish so well explained the gap between the good and the bad in investing in debt funds right now. So the, the way to explain the good and the bad is this. When you invest in a debt fund, getting into what we are facing in the inflationary worry scenario is that your losses are absolute, whereas your gains are relative. Therefore, to avoid such a scenario, you'll be on the lower end of the curve, which is uh, from 
uh, overnight liquid to uh, you know money market funds there's another category of funds that could possibly work for some investors is the floating rate funds now if they are run true to label right and even they have a year and a half to two year modified duration but if the reset period is well done i think you will make slightly better than uh, you know a liquid overnight and low duration to taking the risk in the medium to uh, you know short term debt fund so there is easily a simple answer which is a floating rate fund which is true to label can you simplify that i mean the reset period a lot of people might not quite understand okay. it entirely santosh so in a floating rate fund you're trying to actually make the opportunity of changing interest rates work for you so you know in a rising interest rate scenario you have to buy the newer paper so that the yield is accretive into the portfolio but how often you actually have a method to change that determines the outcome on the portfolio in terms of return because if you don't change you're actually losing money if you change you're going to gain money but there must be an ideal period for it now this component of rechange called reset in a floating rate fund now some people do have a reset which is the fund manager's discretion some people will reset maybe on a quarterly or a half yearly basis i think in the given scenario a half yearly reset with a one and a half year kind of a duration in a floating rate fund is an ideal situation where you'll be better off than the extremely low yields on the lower end of the duration okay and i would presume so there's just one quick follow up before i go back to ashish that a lot of people want safety when it comes to investing in debt bonds currently this would be the safe options right absolutely so this is not only safe it also gives you the maybe 30 40 50 basis edge between a overnight and liquid fund so it's it's a combination of both while you're being safe you'll get that extra uh, bang for your buck okay and ashish just one quick follow up would this strategy be for example i'm just asking would this or could this strategy be short lived in that Uh, it is subject to significant changes if indeed the interest rate scenario stabilizes or it actually goes up in a much yeah. more steeper fashion than what people are envisaging right yeah so you know you, this is actually just kind of you know biding your time because let's say theoretically you are at a uh, you know you are close to the bottom as far as interest rates are concerned and as uh, some of our uh, viewers might be aware or maybe they'll appreciate it conceptually that when interest rates start going up Uh, you know the bond prices uh, start to have a depreciating uh, tendency so clearly if you think that we are at the lower end of the interest rate spectrum right now and from here on interest rates have to rise and bonds or you know mutual funds being market animal clearly uh, they take the price of the the nav takes the price of the bond on a daily basis right which means that if interest rates were to rise then the principal value of the bonds would dep- depreciate but the fact is that bonds with less maturity uh, or very low maturity either they don't depreciate or they depreciate minimally plus the fact is that uh, you know when you invest in a ultra short term fund or a short term fund uh, the maturities of the papers the maturity of the bonds you hold is maybe 3 months 6 months etc so conceptually the way to understand it is that when you're sitting on a seesaw right if the person on the opposite uh, side is extremely heavy and you run the risk of getting thrown up in the air the best way to prevent yourself from being thrown up is to sit as close to the uh, center uh, as uh, possible so that's what we try to do that you know when we think interest rates are going to rise uh, we try to stay as close to zero maturity or as close to short maturity as possible or uh, like santosh said that you know floating rate bond is some it may have 1 2 3 4 5 year maturity but basically the interest rate keeps getting readjusted uh, every Uh, three months, so it functions like a long bond, but functions like you are sitting close to the uh, center of the uh, seesaw. Uh, so the idea is that you know, if you think we all believe right now that we are at the low point as far as interest rates are concerned. From here on, there is a high probability interest rates will go up. So it's an intermediate strategy that for the yeah. next one to two years, maybe next one one and a half year, oh, it's better that uh, you know you play this as an intermediate strategy, like you like you probably pointed out. a year or two later let's say 10 year bond is 7.5% or 775 let's say short term rates are higher maybe rbi has gone through a spate of four or five interest rate hikes then you know you can buy long term bonds and you know maybe right. then you can change the strategy uh, but for now uh, you have to bide your time mm. 
We were sitting at the center of the seesaw may not be too much fun, but it's certainly safe. And in this environment, that is exactly what you might need. Okay, uh, let, let's talk about um, another topic. I, I, and I think uh, uh, the last week's show viewers that we did uh, with ICICI approved, uh, we, we kind of brought forth a portfolio strategy of sorts, uh, which and if a viewer can, or which you as an investor can adopt uh, for FY23, arguably, for the next two years, because you don't just invest from a one-year perspective. That's the question I think that I'm going to pose to both our experts today, that if you are to build a portfolio of sorts currently of mutual funds, category-wise, which are the funds or which are the categories where you should pick and what are the weightages that they would assign to each of these categories? Santosh, can I start with you on this? Um, like I said in the past interview also, Neeraj, I'm beginning to you know believe this and also realize for all our investors that one needs to be in a diversified multi-cap strategy. Now, this is irrespective of the markets, you know, whether you're in the midst of 2020 when things were in the doom and gloom or whether just two days ago when the market thought it's going to hit all-time highs all over again. Now, the reason is one does not know what factor or trigger is going to come in at what point of time. I think that is something that we all have to take it in and, you know, be realistic that, we have to be in good quality companies. Now, whether it's mid, large, or small, we don't want to differentiate that. A portfolio should consist of a very prudent combination of all the three. So, therefore, the, the dominant category over here is a multi-cap. Now, I know when I when 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 I say multi-cap, people ask me, Santosh, do you mean flexi-cap or multi-cap? The answer is very simple. All flexi-caps are also multi-cap, whereas a multi-cap has got a little more, one more edge around it that it's got a static uh, reserve for large, mid, and small cap. Now, this is a good all-weather strategy for people to stay invested. Con consider this as your all-weather portfolio strategy as far as equities are concerned and just let it go because you've got mid-cap, large-cap, small-cap, well-chosen, picked by the portfolio manager working for you. Don't worry about uh, selecting specific large-caps, specific mid-caps, specific small-caps. Then you will be timing and then you will be chasing performances. A good multi-cap flexi-cap strategy is an all-weather proof strategy. Mm. I'm just wondering, Santosh, why not leave that little bit of leeway for the fund manager to choose between the market caps as well? So why not a flexi-cap fund as opposed to a multi-cap fund? See, that is very, very uh, valid question. But what happens is you, when you take all the flexi-cap funds in the market, when you look at them, right? Uh, you need to understand the flexi cap as a category was forcefully bought in about a year and a half, two ago, when we had to meet the regulatory requirement for what was the definition of a flexi and a multi. Now, all these flexi cap funds were actually masquerading as large cap funds in excess of 85, 90% large cap. Then why, we could have might as well done a large cap fund. Sure. Flexi cap was to give the investor the benefit of being in one fund where the fund manager had the luxury to change. And that's the question that you asked me. Why not give that extra leeway? If the fund manager is not going to exercise that leeway, that means he's running two large cap funds with two names. Just one is called flexi, one is called large cap. So therefore, if a flexi cap fund is done well, you don't need a multi cap. Therefore, the differentiate between flexi cap and multi cap arises. But you're right. If a fund manager was to be prudent, he will do the sound uh, assessment and judgment between large, mid, and small cap, which I believe will work well for the investor. Got it. Ashish, so, so Santosh, of course, viewers, Santosh is saying that uh, uh, you choose a multi cap fund. And in the current times, that's probably the best uh, strategy that you can deploy. Um, uh, just one last follow up, Santosh. You are not. Uh, so this is if for somebody who's wanting an all equity strategy, for somebody who's wanting a balanced strategy, you would allocate what percentage to a multi-cap fund and what percentage to fixed income funds? Well, that's a tough question because I don't know who the audience is, but still let me just come to some sort of an answer. You are the Assuming, audience, let's say. Or I'm yeah, if I was the audience and uh, what I like right now personally is that I like this flexi-cap, multi-cap strategy because I know I don't want to be running several funds in mid, large and small cap. So I choose okay. between the flexi and multi-cap knowing what the portfolio manager is doing. And the, the non-aggressive uh, part of the portfolio, I prefer to choose a balanced advantage fund where okay. within that, I'll give them one or two chances to different fund managers where they have a difference in strategy. Some people follow the momentum strategy. Some people follow the defensive strategy. Some follow the inverse of the yield curve. Whatever the strategies, they have their own methods to make it work. 
Now, the advantage over there is I get equity taxation, I get fixed income exposure, and I also have a dynamic factor built in which chooses to move between debt and equity. Therefore, yeah. if at, at an overall portfolio level, I got equity sorted, I got fixed income sorted, I also have sort of an autopilot in place so that, you know, when February or March 2022 happened with the Ukraine crisis, there was a chance for equity to rise within the portfolio. Sure. Okay. Fair call. Ashish, uh, you, you, I'm sure over the course of the next two or three years, you guys at the White Oaks table will launch a multitude of categories. But if you were to design and if you had the option uh, to design a portfolio of sorts for yourself, your wife, your kid, how would you go about doing it? Yeah, so first is, you know, I completely agree with, uh, I would go with one of Santosh's uh, points, which is that you should have a mixed, you know, this large cap, mid cap, small cap. And I think he's right in pointing out this whole multi-cap conundrum because they were meant to be large and mid and small, but everybody converted their multi-cap into a large cap fund. And, you know, that caused all the confusion. The second point is that, you know, I don't expect anybody to uh, have that kind of foresight where they will be in small cap at the right time and move to large cap at the right time and stuff. The point is you take BSE 500 as a benchmark and then you do what it takes to outperform by stock selection, uh, not by necessarily you know, trying to say that I can forecast which segment of the market will uh, do well. So clearly, if I have to uh, devise a portfolio, I would have three or four components in it. Uh, assuming, uh, assuming that I'm targeting 12 to 15%, and not targeting like 6%, 8%, 10%. So let's say that I'm somebody who has a risk appetite and I'm somebody who wants double digit return. Then I would put almost like, you know, I would put it this way, like say 50%, uh, 40 to 50% of the money, I would put it in a, a fund which has large, mid and small. I'm not deliberately not putting a label. I'll put it in any multi or flexi, whatever. I'll put it in a fund which is a mix of large, mid and small. So say that's say 40 to 50%. I would always put about, uh, you know, another 20-30% into international funds. And international funds, clearly for an Indian investor, international funds, according to me, are in two buckets. Uh, one is investing in emerging markets, uh, which offer something which India does not offer. So, you know, for example, there are some emerging markets, uh, which are commodity driven. Uh, there are emerging markets like, say, South Korea or Taiwan, which are tech uh, driven, you know. So emerging markets also offer some diversity. Correct. Uh, and the third is US. I think you cannot make an equity portfolio with US being absent in it, really. So I think US is clearly the center of all innovation. And uh, US is where, you know, the most global businesses of the world are listed in the uh, American stock exchanges. So if I were somebody looking at 12, 15% kind of return, I would ensure that about 70% of my portfolio uh, is a multi cap India fund. Uh, a global emerging markets fund and a US equity fund. You know, you can give or take, give and take 5% here and there. We can arrive at, you know, right now I'm giving off the cuff answer, but I would think yeah. about it more carefully. And then 30% would be debt. You know, and that 70 and 30, depending on, you know, my, uh, depending on what type of volatility I'm experiencing, depending on whether I'm running ahead of my return target or behind my return target, depending on what is happening in the market, I would use that 30% to, you know, Sometimes allocate when there is an opportunity or sometimes take profits when I have made a lot of money. So I would run it like 70-30. The 30 is a balancing factor, need for money, urgency, emergency fund, you know, a pot of money to balance or take benefit of uh, opportunities, et cetera. So 70-30, and then I've given you the components. And I'm not a big fan of trying to maximize return on debt. So for me, that 30 would be, you know, something with three to five year corporate bond kind of uh, portfolio uh, because I, I actually conceptually I don't understand high risk debt or I don't see why one should try to maximize return in debt so I would put it more like three to five year corporate bonds with a good rating got it Ashish for somebody who doesn't quite uh, straddle all the spheres would uh, would a multi-asset fund um, be an option too I mean of course it yeah. will also include commodities but still asking you no, no, I think it's a fabulous, uh, I think it's a very, very good concept. Uh, you know, people like we discussed, you know, fixed income investors today, you know, we had this discussion about where we are on the interest rates, where we are in the economic cycle, interest rates are so low, 
uh, people are not getting great return, but the situation doesn't warrant having long bonds in the portfolio. So I think environments, all environments, if you ask me, if you're somebody who's happy with seven, eight percent or maybe eight to nine, or it can land up anywhere between six to 10. Uh, and, you know, multi-asset funds in our industry, uh, there is some confusion because I find that some multi-asset funds have 67, 60-70% in equity. In my personal opinion, that beats the uh, that beats the purpose. My personal opinion is that multi-asset funds should be beating fixed income. They should give some options to the fixed income plus kind of investors. In my previous role, I did try to create such a uh, fund and I'm happy to know it's done well. Uh, but the point is that, you know, if you have something which is, say, 20% domestic equity, 10% uh, international equity, consistently have 10 to 20% in gold, and then have stuff like real estate investment trusts, fixed income, uh, like you said, you know, maybe gold is a commodity, now you'll have silver as an option also. So you need to do all your uh, arithmetic and get the models right. But such a fund, I'm quite sure uh, that it can generate about 8% kind of average return. And, it, and you know, in bad times, it will definitely not break the buck. I don't think it will, in any quarter or six month period, I don't think it will give negative return. At least that's what my experience of the data tells me. Got it. Uh, Santosh, just very quickly, I think that the percentage allocations from you for um, the equity and then in the, the balance advantage category. So the standard would be, I would I would go with about 40 to 50% in equity and about 50 to 60%, because when you mix it up as a whole, I think you'd still come closer to 70, 30. And I think that's uh, sort of concurs with what Ashish also was saying. And I'd also like to add that, you know, my favorite reason of uh, adding multi-asset is an additional point of all that Ashish said, is we, we have benefited in India by being in multi-asset funds. Now, whether it's gold, whether it's uh, US investing or international in, in, investing thanks to the dollar denomination. I think the last number that I can remember is that the 10 year excess return that you made due to rupee dollar depreciation is almost 3% CAGR over the decade. I mean, why would you want to miss that extra return while getting diversification and reducing the standard deviation of your portfolio? And that's the actual essence of diversification. Sure. Point well taken. Okay. Um, I think um, since we are running slightly short of time, let me jump to the educative question because I think a lot of people would understand this well from both of you coming in. Ashish, can I start with you on this? The importance of a fact sheet and what is it that an investor can glean out of a fact sheet which could help her or him uh, arrive at some bit of a decision when it comes to the investment already done or an investment potentially upcoming? So on a lighter note, I can tell you what not to do, which is don't <laughs> read the first couple of pages because they're full of news in a lot of fact sheets. I think in our industry, you know, uh, we all have this penchant of publishing a lot of data and a lot of news, you know, what happened in the last month and what happened in the last quarter. I personally think, you know, uh, I, I personally think it doesn't serve much purpose. So starting by telling you what not to do, don't read all the market updates and stuff actually. Uh, and, you know, but uh, the other thing is that also, uh, you know, fact sheets come with like 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 pages. Uh, so don't get distracted. That's another thing not to do. Focus on the fund in which you have invested. And, you know, the other two or three things I can tell you what to look for. I think by all means, definitely look for the performance update, you know, in terms of what is the trend. Don't look at performance as in last one month or last three months. But, you know, if you're observing, if you've invested in a fund and if you're reading the fact sheet of the fund in which you have invested, the point is that are they outperforming the benchmark? You know, is it something which is consistently happening or is it that in the recent times the trend has changed and they're struggling to uh, outperform? See, the fact sheet cannot tell you everything, but next time you meet your advisor, next time you meet the AMC fund house guy, it will at least tell you what to ask. So if Santosh is advising me and he's told me that put money in this fund, so I'll put money based on his advice, right? And then the fund house will send me the fact sheet. So when I meet Santosh, at least I should know that, you know, Santosh, how's it doing? Uh, as a slightly more engaged investor, I can ask him a couple of questions that you told me to invest in this fund. This is what I'm observing. You know, it's a, it's a good tool for engagement and slowly, slowly it builds the uh, education. So I would say fact sheets are good if you just focus on some data and how and data as in the trends. Don't look at data at this point in time alone. The other thing is to look for, you know, is some of the statistics. Like, you know, what is the volatility of the fund? Uh, how is the beta of the fund compared to the market? I mean, I don't mean to complicate these things, but let us say I tell you that this fund is supposed to be a 
uh, you know, fund which is investing in high quality companies and defensive high governance example. Or if I tell you that this fund is a value fund, the data will tell me, you know, the label doesn't say anything. The data actually tells you whether this guy is doing what he said he would do, correct? So I think uh, use the fact sheet as a tool uh, to engage, not necessarily to make all types of conclusions there and then. Got it. Santosh, what about you? The same question to you. You know, it's a nice name, first of all, the fact sheet. Now, for an investor, like what Ashish said, skip the excesses. If you go to the actual content in a single page, you got enough information about a particular fund, especially the one that you invested, to give you enough to be an informed investor. Because that's what we all, I mean, the aim of even a program like this is to ensure that we got more informed investors. Now, to begin with, you have the scheme objective. Now, so many people get carried away between the name of the scheme and what the scheme is supposed to do because they're not at the scheme investment objective. Second, to know your portfolio manager. What did he study? What is his background? How long has he been with the firm? How long has he been managing that particular fund that you and I are invested in? Then you, of course, have so many metrics. Now, let me make this a lot more simpler. If you're watching a cricket match and there's a the batsman gets out, a new batsman comes in, you'll get a photo of the player, you'll get his key stats, you'll get to know how many centuries he scored, how many 50s he scored, how many ducks he scored, what is his strike rate and how well he's played in that particular ground or that particular pitch. Essentially, that's what a fact sheet is. You know, if you're reading it for the first time, you can be bogged with information, but the more you read, so therefore my take is when you read, when you're beginning to take the fact sheet seriously, if you see it in month one, give it a break and come back after third month or fourth month and see it, you'll notice the difference and then you'll turn to appreciate certain things. See after one year, there is something called the portfolio turnover ratio, which means yeah. how many times the stocks have changed. You can compare, let's say from 1st of Jan to 31st of December, have the stocks and the percentages really changed. Does that mean my portfolio manager is an active guy, one with the stock, second with the weights? Then look at how you, your performance is. Have you been able to beat the benchmark? For example, calendar year 2021, Nifty itself gave you 24% return. How many of your funds gave you in excess of 24% return? Did it beat the benchmark? Not beat the benchmark. I think that's why I think I like the name. Whoever got the name is is been more apt with it. That's a fact sheet. Are there some standard numbers out there? Like, for example, the turnover, what is considered to be over churn? What is considered to be uh, a good good turnover ratio, Santosh? So I wish that we did have a standard because the reason is we have such a wide gamut of funds. Now, a large cap fund will have a lesser turnover, a mid cap or a multi cap. Like we just okay, what's an spoke. average, if not a standard? See, an average is 30 to 40% for any category is a very good number. Okay. Because that means, see, there's a churn because there's a lot of redemption. There's also churn because you want to, uh, you know, increase the weightage or decrease the weightage depending on the flows and maybe even inclusions in Nifty or the indexes. So that 30-40% in an actively managed fund is a given. Now, if it's 100 and 150, then you should look at whether the portfolio turnover and the excess return generated matches. You know, even then it's worthwhile, but otherwise, you know, over 100% is a bit much. Got it. Ashish, before we wrap the show, uh, for all the fact sheets, and I know that you have a penchant for writing a lot of things, whether they come in the fact sheet or otherwise is separate. But let's assume that some of your material will go in the fact sheet of Vito. What is that one thing that you would wish the investors would read out of that very long fact sheet, particularly in the things that you are kind of either writing yourself or making it a point that it comes in the fact sheet? I think that uh, it's our duty. Uh, as investment professionals, that you know, one part is to ensure that we uh, manage money such that we meet the objectives of our investor, which is basically to make a reasonable return and to consistently outperform the benchmark. But you know, all of your professional uh, aptitude will come to a knot if your investors are not engaged with you and they don't stay the course uh, with you. Because one of the big issues with our industry is that. We get money when performance is good. We get money when markets are booming, uh, but we lose money when markets are bad or when performance is actually uh, dipping. So the key point... It's changing to, a bit though, you have to say, Ashish? Oh, yes. this I mean, uh, you know, uh, last year, year and a half has uh, seen uh, maturity, right? Uh, but generally, by and large, we have seen is that 
you know funds we expect people to stay invested for 5 7 years 10 years as long as possible but then funds also go through their patches so i think what one would want to communicate is communicate stuff and communicate perspectives which will ensure that investors can stay the course so my preference is to communicate behavioral aspects or to provide perspective on numbers you know like if a fund is doing something the way uh, doing why is it behaving the way it is behaving what is the perspective uh, what should you be telling investors so that they can see it in the right light and you know they stay engaged the point is you know as you know is very well known that there are many funds which have delivered spectacular return over the years but people didn't stick to the whole journey right it's well known that investor return is not equal to the return generated by the investment itself why does that happen that happens because people come at the wrong time go at the wrong time and they get disengaged somewhere uh, in uh. the journey so my preference is that a fact sheet should should communicate things which uh, keep people engaged okay well we'll we'll watch out for it when it comes in from the white oaks table uh, but gentlemen uh, thank you so much for talking to us today i know we couldn't cover everything but i think we've done enough for this show at least uh, look forward to have uh, you guys again and much appreciate thanks neeraj thank you thank you thank you pleasure ashish to be with you on the show thanks neeraj again now uh, the pleasure having both of you viewers thanks for tuning into this leg of the meeting